Sup, you beautiful bastards. You're watching The Philip DeFranco Show, and we got a lot of news to talk about today. So hit that like button to let YouTube know you like these big daily dives into the news. But the first thing that we're going to talk about in big internet social media drama news, I want to talk about this, this internet backlash cycle we saw with Hassan Piker this weekend. Because it was really interesting to see like how it evolved. And while obviously I hope this is the case with any story that we cover on this show, I'd love if you reserved your comment on this one specifically, if you, if you have a comment to share until I finish the story. Because the way this whole situation started was with this specific clip of him going viral, which several captioned a variation of him saying that streaming is harder than a real job. Yes, a real job can be gruesome. A real job can make you very tired, but a real job doesn't suck the soul out of you. You know what I mean? In the same way that nine hours of streaming absolutely will. And so unsurprisingly, this blows up. Tons of people saying he is completely out of touch with the real world. Content creators are so fucking annoying. People saying they would kill to have a job and lifestyle like his instead of making coffee for $12 an hour. Specifically saying this guy makes shit up for nine hours a day and his commute to work is walking into his fifth bedroom in his $3 million mansion. But this is others defending him saying, hey, this clip was taken out of context. And adding, I get that expecting the neats on this dumbass site to understand the nuance of how different jobs drain you in different ways is insane, but oh well. And this is something that Hassan addressed himself, explaining. I was talking about how much a nine hour stream eats away at my social battery and how I can't socialize after, comparing it to my sales job before. I recognize how fortunate I am every day. But then including clips of context where he says, No, 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 no. Social battery wise, unless you're in retail, unless you're in retail, it's very different. A real job does not expend your social battery in the same way as someone who did a sales job, a real job, okay? I'm telling you, as someone who did, did both, like, nine hours of, of constant performance and people-pleasing taps you out from social scenarios. After nine hours of that, I could probably do physical labor it would not bother me but i can't do more social that's my point we're saying you could compare it to some real jobs like customer service because those are the ones where you're just always on that involve the most emotional labor and adding yeah think about it this way like um, you give presentations for your job right imagine giving a presentation for a nine hours straight i'm a profoundly fortunate individual this is the lottery. Having said that, my social battery runs out after nine and a half hours of streaming, nine and a half hours of constantly trying to be on, takes a mental toll on my social battery specifically. It's not as physically to, uh, uh, tasking or uh, taxing. Right, so it appears that he's talking about how uh, certain jobs can drain a certain facet of your energy more. And saying, sure, there may be people with a variety of jobs, including some people even in sales who would argue their job burns out their social battery. But for him, saying streaming can be a heightened version of that. And so there, like, I, I understand what he's saying, though I, I do have a, a disagreement, although I'm not even sure it's a, a disagreement. Because like, even with the full context when he's talking about like other jobs, right, people can get breaks. But, like part of the reason I get frustrated with myself whenever like I have complaints about my job is that pretty much all the problems in my life, they are self-imposed. And I am in a powerful enough position at any point in my life to go, I'm going to cut it short today. I'm going to take that extra break. I'm not most recently going to work through President's Day. And understanding that from a business owning standpoint, yeah, I might take a hit. I might make less money. And this is I'm in a powerful enough and well enough off position that I can make that choice. Right, so it's about balance and compromise and making concessions. Like right now, I could be making three times the money that I am making but I'm not doing that because I know that it will do things to me that over a certain period of time will make me want to jump off a fucking bridge. And I would guess that Hassan is probably self-aware enough to realize that he is one of his own biggest enemies. Like a lot of self-employed people are. And so if it was a big enough deal to Hassan that, you know, his social battery is drained because he has this current schedule and this current thing, then he has the power to change that. So you can understand where he's trying to come from and what he's meaning, but you can also easily see why it might be hard to sympathize with to someone who doesn't have control over their schedule or work. Because I want to do the, the stupid thing that you do on the internet uh, with having like a, a nuanced take on something is that I think a lot of the clips that went viral of him with this situation were taken out of context. They do not include the nuance. But you can also see that while at the same time, while taking in the full scope of things, not not empathizing with uh, some of his points. Because yeah, I took it more of like, if you have a job where you're talking to people all day when you get off work, you might just want some alone time. You might not be good at talking with people. If you're a chef and you've been cooking all day, you might want just some fucking toast and beans. You've been working some physical back-breaking labor job. The last thing you want to do is some fucking chores at home. You probably want to just grab a, a drink and shoot the shit with people. But then finally, to like put a little personal touch on this, after a day of shooting the show and filming out uh, you know, deep dives into stories for future episodes, literally the last thing I want to do in my real life is talk about the news. But just like what I think Hassan is saying, this is not me saying my job is harder than 
than other jobs. Do not confuse that because it is not. This is literally the easiest job I've ever had. Because you know what? My life is not paycheck to paycheck. My asshole boss, that's me. And if at any point I want to stop or change things, I can. And again, I say all this with a belief that a real world job is infinitely harder than, you know, streaming or making YouTube videos. But I also feel like given the full scope of everything that he said and the full context clip, it like this has blown up to insane proportions. But with now all that said, and I thank you if you waited until this moment, I'd love to know your thoughts on this in those comments down below. And then on the note of just absolutely horrific, shitty jobs, let's talk about these two things that have popped up. With a starting with a McDonald's in Boston, where on Saturday, a customer allegedly became so infuriated that he punched an employee several times. And as far as what got him so riled up, well, According to police, the worker touched the lid on his cup. But then, like, if you thought that response was over the top, just wait for this one. Because it starts off nice and normal at Dunkin' Donuts in Florida yesterday morning. The police saying a drive through employee gave a man a free cup of coffee. And then, for reasons unknown, that customer became irate. With him then allegedly throwing that searing hot coffee into the worker's face, causing her skin to blister. Which also, side note, why does it feel like so many fast food horror stories involve coffee? Ever since that story 30 years ago, where a jury awarded a woman $3 million after McDonald's hot coffee burned her. All the way to more recently, a year ago, this woman sued Dunkin' Donuts after an employee spilled black coffee on her legs, burning 30% of her body. I was hearing her call 911 in agony. She spilled the coffee all over me. Oh, I'm so much me. Though seemingly, coffee has also become a weapon of choice. With stuff like five years ago, a guy throwing hot coffee in a drive through worker's face because he waited too long for his french fries. Or a couple of years ago, a guy threw coffee in a customer's face because they weren't wearing a mask. And then several months ago, a man allegedly burned a McDonald's worker with coffee because he thought his order was too expensive. Which like, my guy, I didn't like paying two sixty nine dollars for a hash brown either, but there's a fucking line. Though also, out of fairness, I should mention coffee has been used for good. Like 10 years ago, at Dunkin' Donuts, the clerk threw a pot of hot coffee in a robber's face. But the main point is, uh, be safe out there. Because people be crazy. Crazy. And then human beings are just a funny, weird mess for a number of reasons. With one of my favorites being just how a, a section of the population of this species, anytime a new thing comes out, a new technology comes out, we set the land speed record. We go zero to sex and porn like that. All the way back from cave drawings and wood carving to uh, VHS and DVD and the internet and now AI. With one of the most talked about things in that space right now being video creation. Especially as last week we had OpenAI showcasing Sora, a new generative AI model that takes in a simple prompt, right? Just text, but then spitting out a stunningly beautiful video leaps and bounds beyond anything we've seen in tech so far. And so with that, there's no surprise that we're seeing players in the adult industry jumping on the bandwagon. Though not specifically because of Sora. Because you gotta give uh, people in the entertainment space uh, the respect they are often visionaries. They often jump on stuff before the wave comes. So it was in no way surprising to find that multiple booths at this year's AVN Adult Entertainment Expo showed off their new sexy AI. But the general idea being like, okay, what would it be like if we created ChatGPT, but instead of training it on regular material, like mass market stuff, they have it scrape and analyze the bottomless well of explicit images and videos that make up a part of the internet. With, for example, Stephen Jones, an old school porn mogul who was put out of business by Pornhub in 2013, telling the Washington Post that he saw an opportunity to get back in the game when OpenAI broke ground in 2022. And with that, he bought the domains porn.ai, deepfake.com, deepfakes.com, then hiring some employees and getting to work training an image engine on free photos. And so now his customers prompt the AI to create their perfect dream girl, feeding it detailed text descriptions of appearance, pose, and setting. But also with this, the way he sees it is that this is only the beginning. Because you have Jones telling the post that he envisions the tech advancing from simple images to photorealistic videos like Sora, and then saying that from there, it'll become interactive. He was just giving real-time instructions to lifelike automated performers. So right in the middle of a scene, you could say, do this, do that. Now smile at the camera. And you've got Jones predicting that within two years, there will be fully AI cam girls. But, you know, with all this hype, there's also still plenty of questions up in the air. Like first and foremost, will customers actually pay for this? Or rather, will enough pay for it to be a viable business model? Because according to Jones right now, he's only breaking even and all the revenue is just going toward improving the AI. Though notably, the, the market clearly exists, right? His user base includes 500,000 people, many of whom are paying customers. But then you've got another question, like how do you prevent the AI from generating content depicting violence, rape, or underage people? Right? Especially because with the first two, like there can be a fine line between kinky BDSM and actual abusive torture. So there you have Jones saying that his team takes down images that users flag as abusive, adding that they've blocked around a thousand prompt terms so far. And Jones adding with this, I see certain things people type in and I just hope to God they're trying to test the model like we are. I hope they don't actually want to see the things they're typing in. Though of course, you know, with that, users are always finding loopholes to trick the AI. And that's in addition to the potential for deep fakes of celebrities, of which I mean, we're already seeing right now. Right, Taylor Swift, Billie Eilish, Pokemane, hell, even Millie 
Bobby Brown the moment she turned 18. Not to mention, you know, non-celebrities like a friend, a coworker, or a classmate who never consented to appearing in porn. And finally, there's been the big AI question that's also been associated with other industries. Could this, will this eliminate jobs? Because if more people just start getting their porn from AI, that could reduce the demand for real performers. Though there, there could be a benefit to some famous names in the industry who could profit off of licensing deals. Though there, that could also get tricky for a number of reasons, including not everyone actually owns the rights to their likeness because they've signed them away in contracts. But then on the other hand, you have some arguing that AI porn could actually usher in a more ethical industry. Because if your actors don't actually exist, you don't have to worry about performers being pressured, underpaid, or otherwise harmed. Well, I know that I've given you like just a huge load of uh, stuff to, to take in. Like with everything on these shows, I'd love to know your thoughts. But I, I, what I find fascinating is how over the last 20 years, technology in general has like the, the big focus has been like, how do we bring humans together? And then apparently the, the natural evolution that came from doing that is that humans never want to interact with another human being because just, you know, they're not an on-demand thing. They're slow or they get in the way or they require too much from you in some way. So what if we just never had to deal with them? You know, they're just so needy with their sleep cycles and uh, <laughs> personal goals and feelings. Ugh. And actually, yeah, as I sit with it, it kind of it kind of makes sense that that humans are doing this. The internet started as a place to share things and then it, it turned into we want to entertain people which means that we're to a certain degree a product and with a dopamine drip gimme 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 more social media stuff we became on-demand entertainers and now for many the the humanity of it all gets in the way it's weird anyway uh welcome to uh phil having half-baked thoughts that he's trying to process while on camera and then in the least surprising news of the weekend we have a shane gillis controversy with this big debate happening online right now that's also i, I think notably bigger than Shane himself. It really feels like more about the current state of comedy and also like reactionaries online. Because like depending on where you went on social media following him hosting Saturday Night Live, drastically different reaction. Like I popped over onto threads and people were like, oh man, Shane Gillis bombed. What a cringe fest. And then you hop over on X and people are like, that was stellar. He crushed it even though a bunch of that audience wasn't on his side. And you know, in no way was this surprising, especially with Shane Gillis specifically, right? He was actually hired to be a cast member on SNL back in 2019. Though of course he famously got fired before he ever made an appearance on the show because of podcast clips that resurfaced. And then fast forward to Saturday, you had people tweeting things like, I can't believe he said the R word or talking about how young sons hanging out with their moms are gay. I will say for like the full context of these jokes and also so you can watch the monologue yourself and be the judge yourself rather than just seeing other people pop off their opinions based off of clips. I'll link to the monologue video here over on YouTube. But for me, I just kind of hated the the culture war stuff on both sides. Like there were some people that were just like, yeah, he said those words. And then that is there were also other people that like never wanted to even fucking give the guy a chance. But to me, like it just felt like a straightforward on brand for him comedy set. I mean, literally part of the set are jokes from his special. And maybe I'm biased here because now having watched enough of Shane Gillis, both like it's just him speaking shooting this shit as well as his comedy specials, I do not feel like he has any ill intentions whatsoever. Whereas it feels like a number of comedians have like made it their point to attack certain groups. But like to me, and it's subjective, I find him funny. And I also think he objectively understands how to create a joke. And personally, I think he's kind of one of the most hilarious people out there. I might get shit for saying that, but it is what it is. And you of course can agree or disagree. We still allow that here. About some things. <laughs> and then, so let me ask, how many of you wish that there was a better solution to paying off your debt? You know, the rising cost of everything isn't helping matters. If you're at the point where you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, today's sponsor, BDS Debt, has a program that rolls all of your payments into one low monthly payment. Our BDS Debt offers options that allow you to pay off your debt in a fraction of the time, saving you thousands in interest and fees, which is huge. Just one low monthly payment based on what you can afford. And everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies. And get this, there is no minimum credit score required. And BDS Debt is giving you a free debt analysis just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash defranco. Yet you'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. Just go to pdsdebt.com slash DeFranco and get your quick and easy debt assessment today. It's time to take back control of your life and live for you not your debt. And then, long and successful marriages, they're, they're built on trust and communication, correct? So we feel like we could agree on that. Also, to a certain degree, weird, dirty, sweaty sex. But even there, you know, at the core of it, it's trust and communication. And so with that in mind, let's talk about why my man Tyler Loudon is getting divorced for a very newsworthy reason. Because right? as we've now learned, back in 2022, Tyler, who is from Houston, and his wife were both working remotely, with their home offices being about 20 feet apart. But their problem was in proximity, right? You're around each other, all of a sudden you're getting on each other's nerves. That's not the issue. The issue is that his wife held the positions of 
of Mergers and Acquisitions Manager at BP, and they have been working on BP's acquisition of Travel Centers of America, which is a truck stop operator. And if you know anything about these sorts of things, these kinds of plans are supposed to be hush-hush. They're supposed to be confidential. But Tyler, seemingly unable to mind his own business, began eavesdropping on calls regarding the acquisition. And then more than just listening in, he decides he's going to put that information to use. And over the next couple of months, he buys more than 46,000 shares of Travel Center stock without telling his wife. And my man Tyler was committed. He sold more than $2 million worth of positions in his brokerage account in Roth IRA in order to buy those shares. Not exactly a sneaky move, Tyler. And then when the acquisition was announced publicly in February of 2023, Travel Center stock jumped by 71% with Tyler selling everything and he pocketed more than $1.7 million. And all without telling his wife. And he seemingly thought that he was in the clear until about a month later. Because that is when the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority asked BP for a list of people who knew about the acquisition of travel centers before it happened. With the wife then hearing complaints from a former colleague who worked on the deal about turning over personal information to BP's lawyers in order to comply. And the wife seemingly just thinking that she's sharing like that workplace drama with her husband. But then Tyler asks, our current employee is going to be placed under this same scrutiny? She then says, well, yeah, of course. And that's when Tyler decides to unload and fess up, telling her all about the travel center shares that he bought and sold. And Tyler's saying, hey, I just wanted to make enough money that you didn't have to work such long hours anymore. Which I just got to say, homie, if you have $2 million worth of stuff that you can just move, money is not the problem. Greed is your problem. Like, I understand when people go, you know, a million dollars ain't a million dollars anymore. It's still a fucking million dollars. And you were just able to go, yeah, I'll move $2 million. But the main thing here is that his wife was reportedly totally blindsided and immediately reported the situation to her supervisor. Where, despite there being no evidence of her involvement in this or even knowledge of this scheme, she got placed on administrative leave and then fired. With her then packing up her stuff, moving out, and beginning divorce proceedings. As far as our guy Tyler, he has since pleaded guilty to securities fraud by insider trading, and he's facing a maximum of five years in prison along with a $250,000 fine. And of course, that's on top of being ordered to not only repay the $1.7 million that he made from the shady sale, but also the SEC filing civil charges against him. Though as far as his actual punishment, his sentence is scheduled for mid-May. So yeah, uh, long story short, trust and communication. Very, very important. And that also includes uh, not using your partner to commit uh, securities fraud. That last one, very specific, but maybe it'll help like one or two of you. And then, as an American, I sometimes hate covering news about like other countries having issues with their healthcare systems because it feels a little bit like I live in a crack den, but we're going to talk about, you know, you having a leaky roof. But also, you know, there is merit to talking about someone else's leaky roof because it gives you an ability to kind of compare and contrast problems. And I say that today because what we're talking about is the medical system of one of the world's most prosperous countries. And it's an absolute shambles right now because of massive walkouts and protests by junior doctors. Also, I'm actually not talking about the UK for once. Instead, I'm talking about South Korea because it's now actually gotten to the point where officials are warning the protesters they have until February 29th. Otherwise, they face losing their medical licenses, massive fines, and possibly prison time. Right, and at the root of all of this is a government plan to expand yearly medical school admissions by roughly 65%, with the government there seeing it as a necessary step to deal with one of the lowest doctor-to-patient ratios in the developed world and to combat the world's fastest aging population. Because yes, already, regular people need doctors, but also old people need doctors more than most. However, you have the protesting medical students and interns claiming that by lowering the standards for admissions, you're also going to lower the quality of the doctors. And they also argue that the current university system just can't handle this influx of doctors. Which also, I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but important to know, in South Korea, many careers only care if you went to one of a handful of prestigious schools. And if those major universities aren't ready for more students, then there could be a crunch. You also have protesters claiming that just throwing more students into the field isn't going to get to the root of the problem. A specific lack of doctors in fields like pediatrics and emergency rooms. Right, and with that, notably, some surveyed said those fields specifically are more susceptible to malpractice suits and just don't pay enough, which we're going to touch on in a second. However, does the government actually have the ability to force doctors back to work? Well, there, uh, yeah, actually kind of. By South Korean law, it can issue return to work orders if it believes there's a public health risk. However, at the same time, there are also realities on the ground to consider. Things like the fact that suspending thousands of medical licenses or imprisoning aspiring doctors, it just makes the problem worse. It could also trigger the 140,000 doctors of the Korean Medical Association to walk out themselves, something that they haven't done yet despite nominally supporting the protesters, which is why many people believe that what the government would actually do is make an example out of protest leaders rather than going after every single doctor, which certainly weakens the position. But this also, and this is a key thing here, as protesting doctors are facing a serious public backlash. Because the government's plan is overwhelmingly supported by the public there by 80%. And we may actually see that percentage go up as stories of how the healthcare system is grinding to a halt continues to make headlines. Things like saying that military hospitals are having to pick up the slack, or how doctors are being shifted to only work in emergency rooms rather than the normal fields to help fill the gap, which is causing things like cancer patients not able to get their needed injections.
infections or tragic stories popping up like this elderly woman who was facing cardiac problems being turned away at seven hospitals because they all thought that it wasn't severe enough only for her to then die. Also, with this, something that may be affecting public support, or one of the big differences between doctors in Korea and those in the UK is pay. For UK junior doctors, they were protesting in part because they were criminally underpaid and overworked. But South Korean doctors, they're among the most highly paid in the developed world, especially if they go into specialty fields, which is why much of the public feels this is just a move by junior doctors to protect that position. But for now, we're gonna have to wait to see what happens as we get closer and closer to that February 29th deadline. And in the meantime, I'd love to know your opinion here. And then, now it is 2024, and today we have to talk about what many health experts are saying is an outbreak of measles. And people accusing Florida's Surgeon General of endangering children. Right in this, as new health data shows that as of yesterday, two more measles cases have been reported among children in Florida, bringing the total number to eight. And all of those coming from Broward County. And here's the thing, eight, sounds and is a very small number. But given the specific context of the situation, you have people saying this is still incredibly concerning. And that in part because measles is one of the single most infectious diseases in the world. So much so that according to the CDC, for every 10 unvaccinated people who come in contact with it, nine of them will become infected. And that's horrifying because it can have some very serious health complications, especially in children younger than five. And this is nearly one out of every five people in America who contract the disease, they get hospitalized. And the death rate of people with measles is around one to three out of every thousand. Now the good news here is that the measles vaccine has existed for a long time time. It is highly effective. It makes it a very preventable disease. But the bad news is uh, not everyone takes this threat seriously. And currently, we're seeing cases and deaths surging globally, partially because of growing vaccine hesitancy after the pandemic. And in Florida, specifically, you have people pointing to Florida Surgeon General Dr. Joseph Ladepo, with many saying that he's played a big role in building that hesitancy, with him receiving widespread criticism for embracing anti-vax talking points, at times spreading misleading or outright false claims about the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. And he's been widely condemned for promoting policies that go against common sense public health guidance. And most recently, he wrote a letter last week after six measles cases were all reported at Manatee Bay Elementary School near Fort Lauderdale. And there, not only did he defy federal guidelines by refusing to encourage parents to get their kids vaccinated, which is the best way to prevent spread and serious illness here, he directly went against CDC guidelines meant to protect kids who are not vaccinated against measles, telling their parents it's okay to send them to school. Because following widely accepted medical science, the CDC recommends that unvaxxed kids who have not previously had measles be kept in isolation for 21 days after exposure at school. And while Adapo acknowledges this, in his letter, he also wrote that instead of recommending that guidance, he would just leave it up to parents to decide if they want to send their unvaxxed kids to school during a measles outbreak. So unsurprisingly, you had a ton of top public health experts condemning the move, with some explicitly accusing Ladapo of endangering children. With Paul Offit, a pediatric infectious diseases expert at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, saying, this is a state surgeon general saying he is not going to enforce any of the tenets of public health in the name of freedom. He wants freedom at the expense of putting children in harm's way. And that was also echoed by the American Academy of Pediatrics Florida vice president, who said that allowing unvaxxed kids to attend school during an outbreak not only endangers those kids, but also risks further spread. Explaining when you have an outbreak, to contain it, you have to follow the public health and safety recommendations, not give people a choice. Frankly, giving people a choice is what got us here. Now with this, I do want to note it is unclear if the two cases identified since Ladapo's letter are connected to the Manatee Bay Elementary outbreak, but the spokesperson telling USA Today that the district hasn't determined any new cases since then, but the fact that both new cases are also in Broward is significant. And what's more, it's also been reported that one of those two cases was the first in a child under five, which is notable because experts have said that this is early days, saying that this outbreak is expected to spread beyond school-age kids as others bring it home to younger siblings. But for now, we're gonna have to wait to see how this develops, especially because with measles, it usually takes like seven to 14 days for symptoms to develop. So in about two weeks, we'll have a much bigger idea about what the actual scale is here. So obviously, this news is both a Florida specific and then kind of more grand and global. And then we need your blood. Also, when I say we, I don't, that not me, the American Red Cross needs your blood. I am not a vampire as far as you know, but America, She's running low on blood right now. With the American Red Cross warning in January that the number of blood donors in the country hit its lowest point in 20 years. And in fact, declaring that the U.S. is facing an emergency shortage. With Dr. Pampy Young, chief medical officer of the Red Cross, saying in a statement, one of the most distressing situations for a doctor is to have a hospital full of patients in an empty refrigerator without any blood products. A person needs life-saving blood every two seconds in our country, and its availability can be the difference between life and death. However, blood is only available thanks to the generosity of those who roll up a sleeve to donate. But this is, unfortunately, the Red Cross has seen a whopping 40% decrease in blood donors over the last two decades. And this organization, which supplies around 40% of blood in the country, they faced a 7,000 unit shortfall in donations between Christmas and New Year's Day alone. And it's actually been impacting availability at a very tricky time of year. Because as you might have noticed from all the coughing that you've been hearing every time you go in public, it's cold, flu, and COVID season, which means these couple of months already see a decreased donation turn. And on top of that, it's winter. And much of the country's dealing with snowstorms and other bad weather that forces people to cancel appointments. And what's really scary is, well, yeah, this emergency marks a historic low in blood donations. It's been a problem for 
for a long time and it's only getting worse. But as you might remember back in March of 2020, you had the Red Cross warning of a shortage as pandemic lockdowns began and shut the world down. And then in January of 2022, the group declared a blood crisis as the Omicron variant spread. And at the time, it was the worst shortage in over a decade because we saw a massive drop for that two year period. And since then, things didn't just bounce back, they've fluctuated. And in fact, actually back in September, we talked about a string of climate disasters creating an especially bad shortage. And the impacts of all this, they're severe. And I mean, it's for countless reasons, right? I mean, you have cancer patients, people undergoing serious surgeries, people in car accidents, the list goes on and on. And hospitals need enough supply to help people with all those needs. But according to the data of 59 community blood centers across the country, 34%, around one third, had just a one day supply or less as of mid January. That's critically low, requiring immediate donations. And the issue is even worse in the Northeast, where snowstorms and bad weather have made it a little harder. When these hospitals don't have enough blood, it puts these medical professionals in tricky situations. With Dr. Eric Gary, executive physician director for the Red Cross, telling CNN, We hear all the time about really dramatic things that happen in hospitals of women after childbirth who have substantial unexpected bleeding and who might require dozens or even hundreds of units of blood to survive. When that blood isn't available, it really diminishes the ability to offer that to somebody who's in need. And adding to CBS Chicago, Doctors have to make choices about which patients can receive a transfusion in a given day. Surgeries like heart surgeries can be delayed waiting for the available blood to be collected and sent to the hospital. And then even hospitals that currently have enough blood, they're walking on eggshells because at any given moment that could change. Or say someone comes in with major injuries from an accident, that person alone could require 100 units of blood. And all of a sudden you've got a serious dent in your supply. With Dr. Daniel Dudley Munn of Riverside Health explaining to Wavy News in Virginia. We don't have the sort of uh, surge capacity that we would normally have. And so, you know, if that one patient comes in and uses 100 units, that might be our whole supply that we have currently for a patient with that blood type. And so it may be impossible for us to get additional units for the next patient that comes in. And adding that when this happens, local hospitals will try to work together to share supply. But when the Red Cross has a limited supply, everybody has a limited su a supply. So we really can't um, we can't make it without the donations. But also, you know, the low supply that we're talking about, the low donations that we're talking about, some have argued that this is going to be a long lasting symptom post pandemic. We're saying this is part of cultural day to day life that has changed since the pandemic. Because right? let's say back in the old days of pre 2020, people used to give blood at drives at schools or at offices. But now those aren't as common as they once were. Right? And the pandemic took people out of the habits they once had, and many still haven't returned to them. And in fact, looking into this, the Washington Post actually did a report on this back in September. And they spoke to New York Blood Center Enterprises, which operates in over a dozen states. And prior to COVID, donations from teenagers and college students made up 25% of donations. Right? And that largely through school drives, but that's dropped in half. Right? Because another thing we saw post COVID is that you had teachers resigning, schools becoming short staffed. When schools are short staffed, blood drives fall to the bottom of the priority list because right? there's just not anyone to run them. And actually with that, you have places like CNN noting that student training has also lessened right? because a lot of upperclassmen used to run the blood drive with them often then passing the torch as they graduated. But in the years of missed school or just missed drives, the whole thing can collapse. And kind of the same thing goes for office drives. More and more people now work remotely or have hybrid schedules. And so all of that's part of the reason why recently you may have seen even more people encouraging blood donations, especially from people who they themselves have been saved from donations. With, for example, Jeff Frazier, who spoke to The Post saying he's been donating for two decades because his pastor father used to tell him that the last few days of a person's life are often the most important. Explaining those last couple of days, family comes in, maybe they mend broken fences. Those are the people I give for so they can have those last few days to get their affairs in order. So if you ever feel like I'm just one person, what can I do? How can I help? Know that just you donating is a big deal. Because actually right now, only 3% of age eligible people donate. And hey, I know there are obviously certain rules about who can donate. And some of those, especially around certain groups, incredibly frustrating, infuriating even. Though there, I also want to note that changes do happen. In fact, for example, over the last year or so, there have been some changes, including around LGBTQ plus donations. So I'm going to include information around eligibility in the description. I'll also do my best to stay informed on this front and come back to this video and change that information if things change. But know that something small that's a few minutes of your time could have a drastic, massive impact on someone's life. And I mean, wouldn't you like to have that in your back pocket the next time you do something you feel really bad about? Because let's be honest, yeah, it's nice. Think of it as like a get out of jail free card, except not real jail, just like guilt jail that you put yourself in because like you are a good person, but you make bad decisions. And just when you're about to like feel bad about yourself and actually have to put in work on that problem, you go, oh, but I, I donated blood. I probably saved like a bus full of children at some point. And there's no way you'll ever be disproven. You might've. In fact, if you think about it really hard, you probably already did. So congrats in advance, you fucking hero. If you need to find out where or how how or when you can donate, 
links in the description. And then finally today we have announcements and yesterday today, which actually the first thing is embarrassing. Cause as many of you know, I have a, a little side business called Wake and Make Coffee. Thousands of you enjoy it every single month and I've got bags in the back, but I actually rarely promote it in the show anymore. It kind of just does fine by itself. But uh, because I'm an idiot, I accidentally put it in for way bigger of an order than I was supposed to. And we made not only too much coffee, but too much hot cocoa, which was just supposed to be this one time seasonal deal. And I gotta get that shit out of the warehouse as fast as possible, ideally before the end of February. So I'm running a little impromptu fills an idiot sale. You can get the variety packs of the hot cocoa and the coffee for 50% off. The hot cocoa outright with the coffee, there's specific offerings. But, you know, think of it as a, a belated Valentine's Day present. All available right now at wakeandmakecoffee.com. Link in the description. But then finally, that brings us to yesterday today, where we dive into the comments on the last show and we see what y'all had to say. And there, there was a lot of talk about bad landlords. People like Pufferkin sharing, my first home had a water line break. Our landlords made us call plumbers and pay for them because they were certain it was our fault for, quote, flushing tampons down the toilet. My roommate and I didn't even have periods while we lived there. Once the plumber told them that the water line broke, they had people come out to fix it, leaving our entire backyard torn up in a muddy mess. They refused to fix it as to them, it was a few patches, no matter how many photos we sent showing otherwise, and saying we drafted up an official complaint, including the laws they were breaking and threats to sue. They fixed it the next day. Also, people like Sassy Sam is sharing. I'm a relocation specialist for insurance companies, meaning I work with policyholders and landlords to coordinate short-term leases while the family's out of their home. I have so many stories of absolutely wild landlords, property managers. My most recent favorite is a lady near Seattle who was trying to pass off her three-bed, two-bath townhome as being worth $12,500 a month. The family wanted an option like that, so I tried negotiating her down to 8K, market rate for the area, and she refused. She started blowing up my phone and email saying the other family was offering to take it for 17K a month for a 12-month lease, and that she would be willing to work with us for 14K now. But saying I let her sit and didn't respond for 30 minutes when all of a sudden she comes back and says 8K is fine. Folks, landlords will try to swindle you every chance you get. I also noticed there were a lot of comments that had to do with water lines and leaks. Landlords just strolling through the apartment while it was being lived in. But I, I also just, I need to mention it here. I mentioned this on the text line last Thursday and then I'm stupid and I didn't handle it. I think YouTube has changed how top comments work on YouTube. There were, there were comments with hundreds and if not thousands of likes. But then like the day after they just get buried and I can't find them again. So just as a heads up, I'm going to try and do a better job of pulling comments at different times for the next day's show. Because there were like a lot of good ones that I read that I just, I can't find and share now. So that's why today's yesterday today is going to be kind of short. But that is where our big daily dive into the news is going to end today. As always, thank you for watching. Also, friendly reminder to take advantage of my stupidity over at wakeandmakecoffee.com. Get 50% off on select offerings while you can. That said, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you right back here tomorrow. You on my mind a lot. Don't need no time. Watch. I don't know how I got you in my pocket spot. Yeah, this bae. Miss you every day. You like my oxygen.